right, so as we think about the book of Galatians, um, as we've been through it, there's a major spiritual battle going on. And the battle is whether uh, those who have converted to Christ from the Gentile world, as you remember when, when Jesus came, um, the gospel was first shared in Jewish areas, those who first came to Christ were Jews, and those who opposed Christ were Jews. So you had a, a split, but um, as the gospel spread primarily through the ministry of Paul into a lot of Gentile areas, there was, uh, there was confusion over the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So these Gentiles in Galatia had responded to the gospel. They had turned to Christ. What was the J word that Paul uses over and over in Galatians, you are what by faith? Justified. You're justified by faith. You're declared right um, before God by faith. Paul had used that again and again in Galatians. And yet these, uh, these Jewish teachers came along and they said, yes, you, you need Jesus. Um, that's, that's great to accept him as Messiah and to turn to him. But if you're really going to be a Christian, you have to keep all of the Old Testament law like the Jews were required to do in the Old Testament. And Paul was appalled uh -huh. that, was, that was an accident but Paul was appalled at that notion that we would add anything to Jesus that we would add anything to the simple gospel of justification by faith so as we've gone through this book he keeps looking at the whole issue from one perspective after another and today the main word that's going to come up is the word slavery okay what, what kinds of things according to the Bible, let's, let's not think about um, you know, slavery of the Jews in Egypt or the Hebrew people in Egypt, but let's think of the metaphorical ways that slavery is used in the Bible. So what, what can we be enslaved to? Yeah. Okay, we can be enslaved to sin. Like um, we think we're in control of our situation, our life. We're like, oh, that, I think I'm going to do that. And I'm in control of that. I can decide when to start and when to stop. But there are, there are many things that once we give in to them, control us and enslave us. Okay, so, so sin is an enslaver. What else? Think of any others? Pride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pride can enslave. Pride, pride, actually, pride can blind us. Um, everybody else can smell it, but we can't. Like, you know, if, if you're proud, part of the... Part of it is you don't notice that you're being proud. Right? That's part of the, the problem with it. Um, how can, and th this is where it gets interesting, the New Testament looks at certain forms of religion as enslaving. How can religion be enslaving? It's false evidence. Okay. I mean, the, there are a lot of religions that are very rule-based. You've got to do A, B, C, and D over and over again, over and over again. And what's usually the problem with that? Can we follow any rules perfectly? No. Even if, I mean, even, even if you try, you're, you're just not going to follow them perfectly. There are forms of what we would call pagan religions throughout history that were enslaving in the sense that like people would offer their own children up as sacrifices. They would, they would offer human sacrifices because they were trying to appease some spirit or some god. But you know, the, the kind that we're talking about in Galatians is the idea of being enslaved to a religious system where you had to be a rule keeper. And so we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that in, in a minute. So earlier in this book, as Paul talks about the Old Testament law, things like the Ten Commandments, um, not just the Ten Commandments, but the Jewish people, uh, they had, well, what, what were some of the other areas of life that were very important to religious Jewish people? Kosher. Okay, the, the foods that they would eat and they wouldn't eat. Now there's a lot of, of possible reasons why God did that. One of the main reasons is in Old Testament times, when you ate with people, that was very significant for your acceptance of their practices, their acceptance of, of them as people. And so if the Jews weren't eating the things that their surrounding neighbors were eating, there was a good chance that they weren't going to be involved in religious services that would tempt them towards false gods. But there were, there were very strict food laws. What else? Certain times of the year you had to celebrate what? Certain... Holidays, okay? 
They had uh, very set seasons and calendars and holidays that you would follow. Um, you had the Ten Commandments and all kinds of other rules that went along with that. Now, were uh, a circumcision was another big one for, for the males. Now, were any of those things in and of themselves wrong to take part in? Was it wrong to follow the Jewish dietary laws? No. Was it wrong to celebrate um, the different holidays like the Passover? No, they were commanded to do that. Was it wrong to obey the Ten Commandments? Should we suddenly start killing, committing adultery, stealing, lying, etc.? Is that what God wants? No. no. It wasn't that those things were wrong. It was that the Jews as a nation had come to believe what about those things? That they could keep them. That they could keep them and that those things would make them right with God. Now, they have two problems with their thinking. They couldn't keep them, and it couldn't make them right with God because they already had a sin debt. So when Paul looked at their way of thinking about religion, he, he talked about the law as, he, he uses a couple of metaphors earlier in the book. He talks about the law as a prison, okay? And in some ways, it imprisons you when you think that that's your only way to get right with God. Uh, he talked about the law as a guardian or as a tutor. It can keep you on the right track morally, but it's pointing to something that's coming later that you need more. He, and here he talks about it as slavery. Okay, And again, what he has in mind is if you are depending upon the law, depending upon rule keeping to make you right with God, you can't keep them. And even if you started keeping them today, you've already blown it many, many times. And we'll get into another reason in a little bit. But would somebody read us that first? We have, we have our passage divided into three sections today. Galatians 5, 1 to 6. Somebody want to volunteer to read that one? Not everybody at once, please. Mm -hmm. Galatians 5 reads, For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand firm. Then, and don't submit yourself to the yoke of slavery. Take note. I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourself circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Again, I testify to every man who gets himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the entire law. You who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You have fallen from grace, for we eagerly await through the Spirit, by faith the hope of righteousness, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. Okay. Thank you. So these, these Gentiles have professed faith in the gospel of Christ. They, they've confessed that they were sinners. They were confessed that Christ, uh, they had confessed and professed that Christ was the God-man who had died in their place. They were placing their faith in that. According to the scriptures, they were justified by their faith. They were made right with God. And then the Jewish teachers came along and said, well, you Gentile men, you were not circumcised when you were babies, like Jewish babies are. You need to go through that process if you want to be right with God. Yeah. Okay, well, a uh, lot of um, reasons probably that they wouldn't have been on a human level very happy with that advice. But is it, is it that circumcision in and of itself was wrong? No. no. But if they were doing it, as a way to be right with God. Is that wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, any good thing that we try to do to make ourselves right with God suddenly becomes a, a form of slavery because we can't do it good enough. It's like going to keep hounding us and hounding us and hounding us. And so he says, listen, if you're going to rely upon circumcision... It's not, don't stop there. You've got to keep the whole law. Okay, you've got to obey every command of God perfectly. Yet you who are trying to be justified by the law are alienated from Christ. You've fallen from grace. He starts using this very, very dangerous language because he's looking at their motives. Now, does everybody who professes with their mouth some form of belief in Christ actually possess salvation? Does everybody who at any point in their life says some nice words about Jesus, are all of them an actual believer? 
No. There are many people throughout history who um, temporarily seem to turn to grace, seem to turn to Christ, uh, but then show through their long-term actions, their long-term attitudes, that for whatever reason, it was an external thing. They were putting on... A, um, they were putting it on on the outside, but not on the inside. So we often will say that you can profess faith without actually possessing faith. Okay? Possession of faith, according to the book of Galatians, results in the indwelling of the what? Of the who? Holy of the Holy Spirit. Okay? That the Holy Spirit actually comes to live within us, and that is a permanent thing. You've been moved from death to life. You've been... You were blind, but now you see. But there's a, a couple passages, uh, and, and you don't need to turn here, but in the book of Hebrews, it talks about uh, it is impossible to renew to repentance, in chapter 6, those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. It seems like there are people who taste, but they don't eat. Okay, they they dabble with it. They like the benefits of Christianity. They like and are attracted to some of the community and some of the things that are going on. But they do not fully give over internally their belief system to Christ alone. That's what Hebrews is talking about. Many of you are probably familiar with the parable of the sower that Jesus told. He talks about those. Uh, he compares it to seed thrown on a rock. It says when they hear. They receive the word with joy, but having no root, they believe for a while and fall away in a time of testing. Okay? Or it says the seed fell among thorns. These are the ones who, when they have heard, go on their way and they're choked with worries, with riches, with pressures of life, and they produce no mature fruit. So there are ways in which people can be initially excited about what they hear initially excited about what they see, but they are not depending on Christ alone for salvation. And it's often proven over time, okay? And that's, that's what Paul is talking about here. He says, well, let's, let's get down to your summary points first. Number one, if you want to fill these in on your boo paper, Paul uses military language, okay? This, the, if, you, if you go back to the Greek and you look at the words he's using, this idea of stand firm and so on, he, he's almost like a, a commanding officer, commanding the soldiers to stand in battle. Stand firm on the gospel. Stand firm on Jesus to exhort the Galatians to cling to the freedom given through the gospel of grace. Okay, so number one, the two words are the freedom given through the gospel of grace. How does the gospel free us? How does it free us? What do you think? The truth. The truth shall set you free. Those are words from Jesus. That's true. We... We, um, we can be blind to the system of belief that we have accepted, and the truth will set us free from that. Um, if you had to lay your head down on your pillow every night, and your acceptance before God was determined by every thought that you had had for the day, every word that you had said for the day, or every action that you had committed for the day, or every emotion that you had felt for the day, how confident would you go to bed feeling about your relationship with God? What problem would you have? You would have guilt. You would have, you would have regret. You would have remorse. You would have memories from just that very singular day of things that you had said, done, thought, felt that you shouldn't have said, done, thought, and felt. Okay? But that is not the basis for our salvation. The basis for our salvation is Jesus, the, the God-man, when he lived in the flesh, he never had a single thought that he shouldn't have had. He never spoke a single word that he shouldn't have spoken. He never had a single feeling or emotion that he shouldn't have had. He never did a single deed that he should not have committed. He obeyed the Father's will completely. And when we are justified by faith, 
all of what he did, all of his work gets credited to us. The Father sees us in union with Christ, connected to Jesus. And so we are, when our head hits the pillow at night, we are accepted as his beloved adopted children, um, whether we've had a good day or a bad. Now, that is very freeing in one sense. Can we take that too far and say, oh, well, okay, then it doesn't really matter how I live. I'll just do what I want because he already accepts me. Uh, why is that not biblical thinking? Why are we not able to do that if we are a genuine possessor of faith? Who dwells in us? Holy Spirit. The Spirit. And the Spirit is transforming us little by little. Now, could you do that? Uh, like, I find that I can harden my heart for a couple minutes. Yeah, like I can, I can get, but you know what happens to me? I, I walk away and I'm trying, I'm, I'm keeping that heart hard and God's working on me the entire time, right? Um, because the Spirit dwells in us. So it is a, it's a very freeing thing. And then number two, turning from the gospel back to the law, back to the law, a fall from grace is indication that some professed saving faith but did not possess it. All right, so, so in that first little section, Paul is presenting the gospel as freedom. You're accepted before God because of what God has done. You're not enslaved to keeping all of these rules. And if you're going to rely upon those rules, you've given up grace, and you've just demonstrated that you really didn't accept the gospel. You really didn't understand the gospel. Okay? So that's where we're at so far. All right. Does anybody want to read our next little section beginning with verse 7? Oh, actually, you know what? Let's do one more in the bottom first. Uh, in verse 5 there, we eagerly await through the Spirit by faith the hope of righteousness. Um, the hope of righteousness is a couple of things. Like, did you ever notice that as you go through life, the, uh, the one of the few permanent things is you take you with you. You know what I mean? Like, like we can change our geography, we can change our job, we can change our friends, our family, but, and oftentimes people are changing those things over and over again because they're dissatisfied. They're, they're unhappy. You know, deep down there's a, a void in their hearts and their souls. But wherever we go, we're still there. <laughs> we're still there. And if you are a Christian, um, part of what you long for is that day when you are righteous. That day when you don't have to take your sins along with you. Like you're, you don't have those bad thoughts anymore. You don't have those, those bad actions. You don't disappoint other people and so on. So that's part of the hope of righteousness. But also the hope of righteousness is because God has accepted us as righteous in Jesus Christ. What does that mean for our futures? What does he promise and guarantee? Eternal life. If you died, you walk out and uh, the, the wind's blowing really hard today and instead of ending up in Oz, that's what Gertrude Ellen and I were joking about beforehand, <laughs> it's... You know, it's windy enough that you, can, you, you don't want to be out there with Dorothy and Toto today, okay? But if something happened to you and you are a believer, you are absent from the body and you are present with the, Spirit. With the, Lord. the Lord. That's what the Bible says. You're present with him. So, so there's the hope of righteousness um, in the sense that one day we will actually, we will actually in our character um, live up to the way God already sees us because of our connection to Christ. And that's a wonderful hope. But then there's also the hope of the rewards of being justified by faith in that we know what our future is. And so, number three, those who possess saving faith look forward to the day when they will be made fully righteous, but now express their faith through love of others. And that's what Paul's going to get into next. Now, he's, he, is going to, he doesn't want to go too far in the other direction. He's, he said, don't rely upon the law. Don't rely upon rule keeping. That's not what makes you right with God. But yet at the same time, if you are right with God, there ought to be results of that. There ought to be fruit of that. There ought to be implications of that. And so after five and a half chapters, 
of trying to get them to think correctly about the gospel, he's now going to get into the results of the gospel in our lives. Let me read the middle section since nobody really wants to volunteer today. So, Thank you, Linda. Go ahead. Start with verse 7. You were running well. You did run well. Who prevented you from being persuaded regarding the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who caused you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I myself am persuaded in the Lord you will not accept any other view. But whoever it is that is confusing you will pay the penalty. Now, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. I, will, I wish those who are disturbing me might also let themselves be mutilated. All right. You were running well. Like, you seem to be on the right path with the gospel. Okay? You seem to be heading in the right direction. Have you, ever, have you ever seen somebody who is running like a 5K or a marathon and they don't, maybe they're a good athlete, but they don't really know anything about running? What do they usually do at the start? Go too fast. Oh, they go way too fast. Like they're going around that track and they are, they are in the lead and they're just, they're like, man, why is everybody so slow? And then what happens on the second lap? lap second lap too. Man, they start falling behind and falling behind and pretty soon they're gasping for air and they're probably in last place because they seem to be running well, but they, they didn't know what they were doing. So Paul's looking at him and says, yeah, it looked like you were accepting the gospel, but then um, you started to be persuaded by these false teachers. A little leaven leavens the whole batch of dough, a metaphor that Paul often uses in the Bible where when you're making bread, you know, if you dump in uh, triple the amount of yeast and so on that you were supposed to put in, what's going to happen when you come back? Gonna up. You're going to you're going to have a disaster in your kitchen. I have done a few disastrous things in my kitchen, which I'll tell you about sometime not on camera. Okay, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but the idea here is um, he's saying a little false teaching can work its way in, and suddenly you have the whole wrong mindset. But then the good news in verse 10, he, he's, I'm persuaded that you're not going to accept this view. I'm persuaded because Paul knew that most of those that he was talking to, he was hopeful that they were going to heed his warning, that they were genuine believers who were just confused, and they were going to return to a reliance upon the gospel. That's what he is hoping. Um, so down in number four, Paul spoke hopefully, hopefully, of the ultimate choice the Galatians will make, but with harshness about those who were confusing them away from the gospel. All right, so he was he was hopeful, but he was also harsh on any type of teaching that would get them away from the gospel. Our our church often has people who will wander in off of the street um, in all kinds of states and stages of thinking. And some of them are homeless, some of them are mentally ill, some of them might come in drunk or high. And so there are times where over the years we've let people share prayer requests or maybe they'll pray and sometimes they'll say some things that are kind of goofy. They'll say some things that are kind of crazy. Um, and sometimes they'll even say some things that we don't agree with, that we don't think are good teaching. A lot of the time we will just let those go. It's the first time they've been there. We don't need to have a big argument in church. But the one time that we will stop and gently correct for the sake of our audience is if somebody shares a prayer request in such a way or somebody gives a testimony in such a way that they confuse people about the gospel. That what they've said confuses about where our hope lies in. <coughs> Not going to be mean about it, but we're going to gently redirect towards Jesus because we don't. Um, but we've also had some people come in. I uh, was sitting in a Bible study about three months ago. A guy came in off the street. It was his first time there. And he tried to hijack the Bible study. Like he tried to take the whole thing over. And what he was trying to teach was exactly what Paul was dealing with here. He was trying to teach our people that 
Jesus is wonderful, but Jesus was really just a moral example, and you've got to live morally like Jesus did if you want to be right with God. Oh, no. All right. Mean. Now, we weren't mean. We said, before, as you leave, would you like another cup of coffee? Okay. But we were, we, I said to him, I said, you can't, you can't do this. You're, you're teaching the exact opposite of what we just preached in a sermon next door 30 minutes ago, and you're refusing to stop, so you need to go. Okay. That's the balance. Anyway, um, we're almost out of time, so let's read this last little section. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Okay, don't say to yourself, well, God's going to forgive me anyway, so I can do whatever I want. No. Use your freedom, it says, as an opportunity to serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. What's he saying? He's saying you can take every commandment given in the Old Testament, every commandment, uh, all the commandments given by Jesus, and really what you're doing is you don't steal, and by not stealing, you're showing love. You honor your parents, and by honoring your parents, you're showing love. He's saying that you know all these things together add up to the idea of love because what does God ultimately want to do? He wants us to love and put others first. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. And so Paul again stresses down in number five to the Galatians to serve and to love. To serve and to love. For five and a third chapters, he has gone after the same thought again and again. When you lay your head down on the pillow at night, you are accepted based upon your faith in Jesus. You're a child of God by your faith in Jesus. You are a true member of the family of Abraham by your faith in Jesus. Okay, again and again, you're an adopted child filled with the Spirit by your faith in Jesus. And now where he's going to take it is those who are the true children of God, who have the Spirit, they are going to live in a loving way and most of you know what's coming is there's a, a whole section on the what of the Spirit coming? Fruit. Fruit of the Spirit, okay? There are implications. There are results of salvation. But if we try to live out the results without having the root of salvation, we are failing miserably. Okay? Lord, help us to understand, to believe. Help us to feel so accepted by you because of faith in Christ that we realize how empowered we are to live differently and to, to be more like you. May that be the reality of our lives today as we move forth in love and service. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.